Good morning. We're going to begin in about one minute. I'm going to give Dan an opportunity to... slides up. Are we able to turn the music off? Lindsay, can you stay here for one second? All right, while we're waiting for the music to turn down, we have Mr. John Banks, who's on our, I'm going to say, uh, DVA Board of Trustees, and he is from the Veterans Home, and he is going to lead us in the P P Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here this morning with us. And I appreciate you all being here. I'm Mairead Painter, the state long-term care ombudsman, and thank you for being here at our annual Voices Forum. This is the first year that I got here at 8.30, and there were multiple residents in the lobby who beat me here. That has never happened before. There has never been a time where I walked in and I was like, oh my God, there are people here. So thank you all for being so anxious to be here and share the morning with us. I just wanna take a moment to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, to my left are the bathrooms. We don't take any official breaks, so if anyone needs to use the bathroom, please feel free to just get up and um, make your way over there. There's also coffee and juice if anyone needs it. We do have a couple of nurses in-house, one in particular, Barbara Cass. Barbara, if you could just stand up and wave. If you need anything, if there's any emergency, please find Barbara. All right. I'm here to kick off our program related to quality, goals, preferences, and priorities. All of these matter regardless where you live and are critical for individuals in nursing homes that they have the opportunity to communicate their unique goals and receive the care that aligns with those goals. This is the basis for person-centered planning and at the heart of quality care in nursing homes. It's about empowering residents to shape their care plans so that they have the daily experiences that they want. That's really what we all want, right? We wanna have a daily experience that makes us feel good about where we live and how we receive our care. Sharing your goals, preferences, and priorities, working in partnership with care team members is what will improve your health outcomes and your quality of life. Providing an emphasis on person-centered planning and the importance of clear communication between residents and care team members is vital. It's through these discussions and adjustments that you can ensure that care remains person-centered and aligned with the residents' evolving goals and priorities. I'm thrilled to see the presence of legislators, policymakers, care providers, family members, industry partners, advocates who are all here with us today. Our collective efforts are instrumental in driving positive change and ensuring that the voice of long-term care residents are not only heard, but acted upon. I look forward to hearing presentations today, which will highlight how high quality is being focused on in the nursing homes of our state, what we're doing with Medicare, 
and the power of resident councils directly from one of our resident council presidents and also a member of our e-board. It's essential that we continue to strive for excellence in care and support providers who prioritize the well-being of residents. I would like to acknowledge and thank the people who worked to make today possible. We have our e-board members, many of whom are here today. These are presidents of resident council who work with me to help shape my legislative agenda, both at a state level and a federal level. If you guys wanna raise your hand, these guys meet with me on a monthly basis and they meet together um, bi-monthly. Do you guys wanna raise your hand? I know you're out there. There we go. There's a few of her out there. Thank you so much. I also wanna take a moment to remember David Peck and Patty Bush who were active board members and passed away this year and they both um, are, are incredibly missed and worked incredibly hard to over the past few years and through COVID to help us pass um, several bills. I'd like to acknowledge my team. Um, we have a new community ombudsman manager, Dan Beam, who takes care of so much with so many things that I do. Yay, Dan Beam. And you all are the first ones hearing that we have a new community ombudsman um, that is new this year, and it's going to be a regional ombudsman who's going into that role, and it's Cindy Scott. So Cindy's in the back. Yay, Cindy. <laughs> and your regional ombudsman. We have Trish Calderon, Sylvia Crespo, Tasha Erskine-Jackson, Stacy Ellis, Amanda Mangifico, Kiamaro Cruz, Brenda Textador. You guys all wave. All right, and we have our intake team members. Sadly, we lost one of our intake team members, Stephanie Booth, this year, very unexpectedly. Um, that was a huge blow to our program. Um, we have with us today Deb Robinson and Kyla Jones. Uh, they didn't come out in Kyla Jones, who are at the front helping. And my administrative assistant, Susan Morales, and Campasong from the commissioner's office, who the two, Susan and Campasong, did an enormous lift to make today happen. So thank you very much. I also want to recognize our resident advocates who are volunteers who go into the nursing homes on a regular basis, if you can raise your hands. These individuals give their personal time to work with residents and to help our program ensure that residents' voices are heard and that we respond and help shape the lives of residents and their councils in their buildings. So thank you all. If you need anything, please seek out one of these individuals today. And thank you all for being here and for your commitment to improve the care and the lives of residents in Connecticut. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and together we can work towards a better future for the individuals receiving long-term services and supports in our state. With that, I would like to present one of our biggest supporters, a true advocate for older adults and people with disabilities in our state, our commissioner, Amy Porter. everyone how's everyone doing today good I love this event so I'm so glad to be here with all of you today I'm glad you were all able to come out and join this great event today I started my morning at our new employee orientation um, up in Windsor and we had six new people starting today I told them how excited I was to come to this event that it's one of my favorite events of the year because it's a great opportunity for us to share information with one another, but we also get to hear from residents about what your needs are, what's working well, what we might be able to work on, how we can think about a legislative agenda that really meets your needs. We've got um, state representatives with us today. We've got a lot of people here to listen, folks from the industry, folks from the state, and, and folks who are residents um, and those that support residents. Um, so we're really excited to be able to exchange this information. I love to learn from you, to hear what you have to say. So 
I want to congratulate the team. Um, let's give a round of applause again for the, the long-term care ombudsman team for putting this event together. <laughs> and thank you to all of you. I, I hope you have a great day, and I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you. All right, and with that, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Julie Robeson from UConn for our first presentation. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All right, so I might be doing some of this to see what slide is up there, so I'll, I'll try to keep speaking into the mic and let me know if you can't hear. Um, but I'm Julie Robison. I'm a professor at the Center on Aging at UConn. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about improving resident experiences with the theme of the day, looking at quality, um, and give you some updates on two initiatives that we're working on at the Center on Aging right now that I wanted to let you know about. Let's see. Okay. So the two new initiatives, one of which is um, a partnership with the Medicaid program in the state of Connecticut. Um, it's a new statewide nursing home satisfaction survey for residents and families. And the second initiative is a research grant that we have received recently from the National Institutes on Aging that's focused on Money Follows the Person and specifically how that program works for people with dementia and people of all different race and ethnic backgrounds. So starting with the nursing home satisfaction survey, um, this is a little bit challenging because I can't really see the slides, and I didn't print them out. It, are they on the computer here by chance? Because some of them have a lot of information on them. <laughs> I could, um, maybe I can walk with the microphone and come down. Would that work? Okay, so now do that, and then I will um, do it on my screen. Yeah? Right here, Lindsay's bringing you. Ah, oh, perfect. Sorry. Thank you, Lindsay. I will get it up on here right now. Oh, now they're gone all together. <laughs> wow, he's trying to email oh. me something. Um, that's why. And when you opened that, the slides went away. So I'm gonna. Skip. That's because he's emailing it to me. Oh, okay. We'll get it for you. Anybody know a good joke? <laughs> Best laid plans. Yeah. Hold on one second. <laughs> You guys are never this quiet. Come on. <laughs> Chat amongst yourselves for a moment. Okay. Okay. Back up there. All right. So I will continue to go while Maraid while Maraid pulls up. Um, let's see. If I stand down here, is that okay? You can still sort of see me, but hearing me, I think, is the most important. Is that okay? All right. So. Um, we are going to be administering a nursing home satisfaction survey to nursing home residents and family members, and um, it's called the Core Q Survey. It was developed by a gerontologist at West Virginia University and his team of researchers, and it has been independently tested. It's been shown to be valid and reliable measure for nursing home satisfaction. Um, and it's actually been endorsed by the National Quality Forum, which is a uh, group that looks very carefully at, um, at measures and um, just kind of endorses whether they are reliable, whether they are um, good to use. And so that's an, that's an extra stamp of approval for this survey. It is, um, satisfaction is directly linked to quality of care outcomes, and so that is why um, a satisfaction survey is being used here. Um, we will be administering the CORE-Q every year in every Medicaid-funded facility in the state. And the Department of Social Services, the Medicaid program, is going to then use the results from this survey, families and residents, to adjust Medicaid rates that are paid um, to nursing homes. So trying to base those rates on a lot of different things, but now including quality of care and including a measure that comes directly from residents and families. Um, CORE-Q is one of several quality of care indicators that are being incorporated into the rates for nursing homes. Um, and the goal here is to really give nursing homes a strong incentive, a financial incentive, to improve 
resident and family experience, and quality of care. You could do it, and you can just use your hand. Oh, up there? Okay. I'm okay over here, but, but now I don't have the slide. Yet. <laughs> okay, it's a team effort. Thank you. So um, I want to talk about the logistics and tell you how this is going to work because you're going to be seeing uh, members of the Yukon Center on Aging research team in the facilities um, once a year. And so we, our research staff are going to go out in person to every Medicaid-funded facility in the state over the course of the year, administer the survey in person to residents, um, long stay residents is, is who this is going to be focused on. And so we'll be surveying about 20 residents in every facility and 20 family members as well. The, um, the selection of the residents and the family will be done by UConn. So we uh, are going to do a random selection of people who are eligible um, through just there's a couple of criteria. And uh, the nursing home staff won't be involved. That won't be part of their um, responsibility, but they will be expected to assist us in, in finding the residents who we've identified and helping us to connect with them when we're there. Um, residents with severe cognitive impairment, those who are using hospice services or those who have conservators aren't going to be surveyed, but family members of all long-stay residents will be, um, will be available and eligible to do the survey. Um, so the nursing home residents themselves will be met with in person, and the families will either receive the survey through email, through mail, through telephone. Um, we'll track them down. That's one of our strengths. That's, that's one of the reasons that the Medicaid program has decided to partner with UConn on this, because we have a long track record, a long history of surveying um, people who can be hard to reach. And so this first year, we're going to be testing the process. We're going to be testing how the logistics work, and then um, what the data looks like, and then the second year, the data will start to be used by Medicaid to, um, to actually adjust the rates. Next slide, thank you. And the survey itself is relatively straightforward and short, so it shouldn't really be difficult for people to do. Um, there are three questions with four response choices for each question, going from poor up through excellent. And these are the three questions. So first, in recommending this facility to your friends and family, how would you rate it overall? Second, how overall, how would you rate the staff? And third, how would you rate the care that you or your family member receives? Um, the, the research group from West Virginia University has tested, they, they started out with actually a list of 22 questions and um, widely tested all 22 questions, including, and those 22 included these three, and all the testing and validation they did um, it came down to combined score of these three items do a really good job of representing overall satisfaction, resident satisfaction with the nursing facility. Um, there's a very small print uh, reference to an article that describes how that testing was done. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to provide that article for people. But that's why it's just three questions. They're relatively general, but the 22 questions were included a lot more specific questions, and, um, and it turns out that just these three really do a good job of assessing overall quality. So I'm going to stop there. That's the halfway point. That's initiative number one I wanted to talk to you about and ask you for, and I'll, I can go back up here, ask you to ask questions. Like, tell me your thoughts or concerns or ideas about this. I see a hand. Um, do we have another microphone, or am I hogging the microphone? <laughs> the, the I see one line. question here. Whoa, that was loud. <laughs> and there's a hand over here, the lady in blue shorts, please. Hi, my name is Jean. I'm from Leeway in New Haven. Hi, Jean. I'm with my friend Charlotte. Uh, my question is, um, would there be any room or availability if people had additional comments? So you have the three questions. I know it's hard to assess data like that, right. but if people had comments, would that be available? So in this first year, we're just trying to get the basic survey figured out and implemented, but there is a group of, of people that Mairead has been working with to talk about possible future um, additions to the survey. Right now, we don't, we don't have the capacity to take um, like qualitative or open-ended information and um, you know, compile it and score it, but that's an idea for the future, and it's a it's a possible kind of next step once you have a, we call a baseline, once we have information about all the nursing homes and kind of 
where they stand and who's doing really well and who maybe needs some improvement. And so we might use um, that as a, at a later stage, some more targeted, um, kind of more qualitative information to collect. So I think this is the first step in, with a lot of opportunity for future refinement and, and targeting and finding that out. So thanks for that question. Kia. Hi, uh, my name is Annabelle Jacobson, and I'm from uh, Masonic in Wallingford. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. Annabelle. My question is, it might be off the mark of what you're talking about, but do you know or have an approximation of how many minutes or hours in the day that um, a resident should have of care? Oh, good question. Um, is there? So we, if somebody else knows the exact answer so to that, I'm going to get her a microphone. We have one of the e -board, one of our e-board members is going to answer that for you. Yeah. It's th currently 3.0 for hours of care. There's legislative uh, material that we're working on to bring that back up to 4.1, but currently it's 3.0. I also have a question. So that's, okay. that's the state um, require mandate right now. Yeah. Okay. So, and I do want to let people know that we are going to have our panel discussion this afternoon. We are going to be inviting um, individuals from uh, policymakers to join us on the stage so you all can ask yeah, so more questions, general questions as well. Maybe so, hold more general questions yep. for that panel. So questions okay. about this, but I'm going to let Any? Jeanette ask a question, then we'll come over there. The question I had was, how are you going to pick the families if the nursing home is not going to be picking them, how are you randomly selecting the families you're going to be surveying? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are going to use data from DPH, from the minimum data set, um, to identify who the long-stay residents are in a, in a nursing facility at a given time. And then we will take a selection from that group. So that's how we're going to be selecting them. And that's how we know the we, three can, point zero. we can, we can um, look at things like hospice use, and we can look at things like um, cognitive ability or cognitive um, <laughs> it's only for long stay residents so um, to, to start off with we're not doing anybody who's there for for rehab but it won't be um, stratified by how long they've been there yeah why don't we do one more question now and I'll be here so you can also you know catch me afterwards because I want to have some time to talk about my other update Yes, thank, thank you for the presentation, and it's uh, very heartening to hear that it's just three questions so that it's not too hard on respondents. When you mentioned that the Medicaid adjustment rates were going to be related to the survey responses, could you go into a little bit more detail as to what that entails? So I don't know that that has been entirely determined and it's actually um, I would pass that off to the Medicaid program if they wanted to <laughs> speak about it we have the Medicaid director right here Dr. Wilson but um, it, it's one of several items that will be used as a quality indicator so there are other items that are co collected through administrative data through DPH inspections all of that and there's going to be a combination of those things do you want to say anything about that or or is that an, is that pretty much covered it here Hi everyone, I'm Guy Wolston, I'm the Medicaid director. A really great question. Um, just to level set, Medicaid pays for about 70% of nursing home resident days, so Medicaid is the big payer in the nursing home space. As Dr. Robinson said, uh, last session uh, a statute was passed asking the Department of Social Services to work with stakeholders, residents, the industry, to develop this quality program um, over the next two years, and that's what Dr. Robertson was referring to. We're still working through the details, so part of the reason that I am here and my colleagues are here are to listen to you, to hear what's important to you as we're designing the quality program to make sure that it reflects your values and what messages you're telling us. Um, I, I do feel very strongly, though, that the work that, that the UConn team is doing is incredibly important to reflect not only clinical measures like bed sores and hospitalizations, but also the lived experience of residents in the house. So I just want to say thank you so much for, for the work that your team is doing. I think it's really important. Great. Um, so we'll be starting in, um, we're just ironing out some kind of logistical issues, but we'll be starting later this year and continuing the first year, trying to wrap up actually in a 
a short year by the, by the end of the state fiscal year, which would be the end of um, June. So you, you will be seeing us, you'll be hearing from us, um, encourage you know, your um, uh, administrators to um, be ready for the UConn team to come in and um, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so um, I think I can do mine. Okay, so a quick, this is, uh, this, this is more of a, just an information and then a couple of thoughts at the end that you might be able to um, give me some advice on. So we just got a research grant from the National Institute on Aging that's focused on, um, as I mentioned before, the Money Follows a Person program and specifically how that program works for people with dementia and, um, and people of different race and ethnic backgrounds. And so um, it's called Increasing Successful Returns to Community Living from Nursing Facilities through the Money Follows a Person program. Um, my colleague, another professor at, um, at UConn, Alice Dillon, and I are the two primary investigators, but it will involve a, our large team of researchers. And um, maybe I'll just hit the highlights of this and not read all of it, because I, I want to make sure we have time for the next, um, next speakers. But in general, most people living with dementia do want to remain in the community if they can, for as long as they can but they're generally a little bit less likely than people without dementia to successfully return to the community if they do have a nursing home stay. And so um, Money Follows the Person program, probably many of you have heard of it, it uh, nationally has helped about 100,000 people who want to return to the community after a stay in a nursing home to do so, and Connecticut has a very strong and robust Money Follows the Person program. And um, my team and I have been working on the evaluation and quality management for the Medicaid program of Money Follows the Person for um, since 2008, very long time. And so um, based on our knowledge and our experience with that and our access to data, the uh, National Institute on Aging has awarded us this, uh, this uh, research grant and we're going to be looking at um, the use of Money Follows the Person for people with dementia compared to people without dementia and also the role that um, race and ethnicity plays. And, and actually we found some interesting, very preliminary findings that um, black and Hispanic people who do end up participating in Money Falls the Person actually have better outcomes. They're more successful in, in returning to the community compared to um, white participants. So we want to explore some of that, figure out what's working well, what, um, where challenges are, and, um, and how we can then make some recommendations to improve the program both in Connecticut but then nationally as well. And Connecticut, again, as I said, has been a leader in, in the Money Falls the Person program. And this is a five-year grant and will be going through um, 2028. Seems like a long time away. So um, we have three different pieces of this research project. One we're going to be doing a series of interviews with nursing home residents and their family members, um, looking at their um, reasons that they either stay in the nursing home or, or um, don't stay. And uh, we're going to be specifically targeting kind of four different stages of using or not using <laughs> Money Falls the Person. So first we'll be looking at people who um, never applied to Money Falls the Person, who, who would have been eligible for it, but didn't because they didn't want to, or we don't know why, that's what we want to ask, ask about. Um, people who did apply but then did not end up moving out. People who moved out but ended up returning to nursing home. And then people who moved out and stayed in the community. So we're gonna be looking to talk to people from all of these groups and family members who've been involved. Um, Second, we were, are going to be asking Money Falls the Person staff statewide, as well as nursing facility staff, about their experiences and their ideas through um, focus groups and interviews, and also a survey that will be administered widely to all MFP-involved staff about these, about these questions. And then third, we're gonna be analyzing ourselves some of the extensive data that we have access to, that we've collected over the years, to really look for reasons for these differences or these disparities. Um, people with dementia in general, and then again by racial and ethnic group. So my last slide, my request for you to think about if you have any thoughts or any ideas, it would be really great to hear either today or another time, um, how should we recruit older adults who, and family members who might have something to say about these topics? And um, what are some of the considerations we should keep in mind for doing interviews with people in, living in nursing homes um, or people who've moved out of nursing homes? And then thinking down the road towards the later years of the grant, how should we share the information that we get, collect 
who should we tell, how should we try to um, you know, create um, actionable steps or recommendations, and, um, and you know, how would we work broadly with nursing facilities, residents, um, other stakeholders, and interested groups. So if you have thoughts about any of that, I'd love to hear them either now or later. I have business cards with me if you wanna catch me at another time. And also, this is my email address, and would love to hear from anybody. So, oh, thank you, and I Hi, see Martha. A I saw that hand go here. up by Martha real fast. <laughs> Hello. Hi, thank you. My name is Martha. Hey, Martha. And I reside at Touch Points in Manchester, and I think it's pertinent to include the conservator in trying to help out answering some of these questions. Okay, great. Because I have a conservator who puts a lot of stops to my advancing great into advice. the community. Thank you. Thank you. That's really excellent advice. I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay. Good job, Terrific. Martha. Thank That's you. a great point. Thank you, Martha. Yeah. So, great so when point. we're thinking about family members, we maybe need to expand the other involved people in, to include conservators. Resident representatives Re resident is one of the na Thank new you, right. national terms. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Other hands. I don't have my glasses on, so Over you might want to wave. Right. <laughs> oh, <okay>. Sorry. <laughs> My team, remind me to wear my glasses next year. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Christine. I'm from Kokomo in Meriden. Um, with our current housing market, how do you guys plan to find additional housing that is on like a first level or for someone who has a felony background or other concerns like that? to help them move quickly back into the community. Yeah, so housing is always a really tough, tough hmm. issue. Did you want to say something? I was just going to say, this morning, this has come up. I don't know how many times I've been asked this this morning. So this may also come up at the panel, because yeah. we've been asked this a lot this yeah. morning. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is the most important issue. And so um, at a minimum, with this research study, we'll find out more about that and make recommendations around it, um, but that's not enough to solve it, so keep raising it. Yeah. I think too, as we have like policymakers here today, we have individuals that are here that are hoping to try to work towards solutions. Like I don't think anybody has a magic wand, but we have the, I don't know if you guys know how fortunate we are to have UConn and individuals like uh, Dr. Robeson and her team who are awesome and partner with state agencies, they partner with our program, um, industry partners and state agency partners that wanna work with us to solve that problem. But um, we know as one of my other roles is um, the co-chair of the Right Size Rebalancing Steering Committee, one of the longest names ever of a steering <laughs> committee, by the way, um, that housing is a huge issue. So something we have to work on. Right. Other questions? Cindy's got somebody in the back. Okay, yeah. Cindy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Annie Marie Balowski from, um, I, I am the resident council president, and this is my first time going from uh, Trinity Hill in Hartford, Connecticut, and I have a question in regards to money follows the person and uh, how, uh, housing. Um, does money follow the person, is it in regards to helping to pay the rent or is it just, or is it the RAP program? Because I'm kind of a little confused there. Thank, thank you. So, so let me just, um, first of all, clarify that I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. I know a little bit about it. I don't know if, if you, um, I know you're not in the weeds of money falls the person, but so money falls the person is the money that provide services in the in the home, and housing is, um, money falls the person works with other funds to provide housing, like a wrap, right? So, yeah, so so our so, role is evaluator, so we don't we don't run the program, but, um, but we've been involved with it for a long time to understand it, but I also wanna defer to the. So what I will say is, a lot of us have partnered with Money Falls the Person and worked with them for years. 
everyone's situation is so individualized, it would be inappropriate for us to give an answer related to if someone was eligible for a wrap or individual circumstances are important that you get an assessment and talk to an evaluator because if we gave you an answer on the spot today, you might be disappointed if you got evaluated and then the answer wasn't exactly what we said, right? So if you're interested, what I would encourage you to do is let your social worker know, ask for that individualized assessment and someone from Money Follows the Person will come out. They'll do an individualized, ooh, I can't remember, individualized assessment of you and they'll talk to you about everything that you are entitled to and that you can have access to and then you'll have a better ability to make that choice whether or not it's appropriate and whether or not you wanna make um, the decision to switch environments where you wanna receive your long-term services and supports. Okay, um, Cindy, way back question, hands up. So if these are related directly to yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Robeson's slides, otherwise we can hold them for open mic. Hi. Hi. I'm Yvette Alvarez from the Newtown Rehab. Hi, Eva. Uh, I hear all about this, about money follows the person, but uh, we are not, I don't think that we are interested in getting information about personal things that we can get. I would like to know in general, what do they generally offer? Uh, so we can have an idea of what are we talking about. I have heard a lot about that, com that service, but I don't have detail as to what exactly uh, people can look to receive from any of those organizations. Not as specific for me or for anybody, but in general, general what is it that they do? Yeah. So Money Follows the Person in general is a program that allows for people who are in an institutional setting like a nursing home who want to return to the community. They can apply to Money Follows the Person, and there's a team of people involving both people who work in the nursing home and people who work in community agencies that will, um, as Marie just described, do an assessment and look at all of the individual needs of that person and then put together a plan for them to move back to a community setting and set up the community services, figure out housing and all of that. So that's in general what Money Falls the Person does. So can I have a show of hands real quick? I have some funding that I could use. Would it be, would it help? Is there a need to do some regional um, information sessions to get people together and have, maybe it's been a while since we did some information sessions on MFP and maybe we could invite the MFP coordinators. They have um, program managers and team managers. Um, they have people from the access agencies. And if we hosted regional sites, do you, sorry, do you think, um, would you all come if we hosted that or if you invited them to your resident council meetings to come out and share with you about the program, I think it's important to get that direct information because if you're saying, you know, individuals move in nursing homes and change, and if you need that connection, you can let your ROs know and they can connect you with the person in your area or we can sponsor regional, you know, it's hard to get everybody here, but we could sponsor regional um, information sessions on home and community-based services. So show of hands, how many people would be interested in that? Oh, that, okay. A community Zoom meeting, oh, that's even, that's a great idea, Jeanette. Thank you, look at you, talking to me about technology. <laughs> I, and I'll just make one last comment and then I'll um, turn over to the next speaker, but okay. also just, just another important thing to know about Money Falls the Person is it is completely voluntary. So if you're happy where you are, you're, you're, you've got the care you need, you're, you have access to your friends and family, it is certainly, you don't have to do anything with Money Falls the Person, it's just an option. So the idea is to give everybody an option of to where they can get their care and live their lives where they're the most comfortable and the most happy. That and I'm gonna say one more thing and then we're, we're absolutely gonna go to Liz, but the other thing is 
everyone, I believe, everyone should get assessed because you don't know what you don't know, and even if you get assessed, you don't have to say yes. All getting assessed does is inform you of what your options are, right? So if you get assessed, you don't necessarily have to say yes to something. You're just going to be fully informed as to what your options are related to your long-term services and supports, and then you're making an informed decision. I would never buy a car, buy insurance, do anything without researching all of my options. So I wouldn't expect anyone, a nursing home resident, or so, I shouldn't even say that, or an individual who lives in a nursing home, I'm gonna stop calling you all residents, by the way. I'm gonna start calling you individuals who live in nursing homes, so. Um, to make those same decisions, okay? And now, thank you, Julie, thank you so, so, uh, Dr. Robeson, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are going to turn the stage over to Liz Stern. And Liz, I'm actually gonna go up here because I wanna introduce her for me. So I don't know if you guys know how lucky we are to have Liz in our state and as part, <laughs> a part of our family council. And we are one of the only states in the US to have a statewide family council. Um, during COVID, we had, a, I started doing these Facebook Live things and we had some family members that decided they really wanted to share with me what they thought I should do and how they thought I should do it. Um, in representing, they were the representatives for the individuals um, living in nursing homes that they cared about. And so these family members, even as things wound down, wanted to stay very active and realized that maybe the way families counts, family councils worked in nursing homes could look a little bit different. So we used some of our funding to get a Zoom license that now supports family councils in any nursing home. So, if your nursing home doesn't have a family council, you can ask for a certain day, a certain time. Your family members can sign up to use our Zoom and get together that way if they don't wanna meet in person. If there's only one or two family members, they can contact Liz, I'll let her talk, but we are so lucky to have the family council we have, and she is amazing, and she's been working at a national level and supporting us, and we're so thankful to have her here today. Thank you, Mairead. And I have glasses with the wrong ones, so I'm gonna look like this. I am so happy to be here today. I see a lot of familiar faces, and um, the names elude me from time to time, so excuse me, and, and, but I was here for the first time in 2017 as a daughter and as a person who started a family council in my mother's nursing home. And it was a very positive, very positive experience for three years. Um, I'm in another chapter right now, and um, I want to start by giving a huge shout out to, you know, I, Marie, that was cute. You sound, I sounded a little bossy there, you know. She tells us what she, but I, I have to say that um, the person I was in 2017, 2016 when my mom had a stroke and threw me into the role of a primary care partner and where I am today is um, all of that education and I have plenty of formal education prior to that I have to say I came from the Connecticut long-term care long-term care ombudsman program there they held my hand all through a very significant part of our family's life and um, and I am eternally grateful to the Ombudsman of Connecticut. When I do travel through the country and I people hear I'm from Connecticut, I hear rock stars. You live with rock stars. So this is not just, we're not, we're preaching to the choir today, but we are nationally recognized as a state that uh, employs best practice. I know many of us get frustrated very often, but once you get out of your backyard and you see um, some comparisons, I can tell you we're, we're moving in the right direction. There's a lot of movement to be had, but um, Connecticut is, is nationally recognized and I'm proud to be living here. Um, I, I th think there's some, yeah, there are some slides. I'm not gonna read the slides, but um, is that, 
and I can't see them either, but this, I think in this first one, Dan, help me, this is where it des describes a, what a family council is. Is that, okay. So a family council, and I'm not going to read it, you can, is, is very, very uh, reminiscent of a residence council, but it's family members, and family is very loosely defined. Mostly they're blood family, but they don't have to be, so that's what a family council is. Um, it's a group of people who get together for the betterment of um, people who live in homes and for the families who support them as well. Next slide, the rights. The rights are similar to the rights that you have. The only difference is, is that um, I, I, we, it's, we have to make it happen and family members have to make the family councils happen and what I've seen is that when a person chooses to live or is living in a, a long-term care facility, usually the residence council, the resident council is already established. And we'll get to that in a minute about the establishment in Connecticut and, and where we're going with that. Um, next slide is open communication. Um, to this slide, I'd just like to add, again, it looks very, you know, similar. Family members feel free to voice concerns without reservation in meetings where staff are not present. Sometimes they're invited, but they don't run the meetings. And it gives facilities an honest feedback to, to you know, to use. I would say that the piece that's missing from this slide is education. It astounds me how many families are supporting their loved ones in long-term care and they don't understand what residence rights are. They may never even heard of residence rights. They don't understand the infrastructure. They don't understand that they have a voice. Um, you know, and, 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 you, and I'm just astounded. <laughs> so I, a big um, omission there and the third bullet would be that the role of a family council is to educate um, the, the members who attend and to get the word out there. And as you all heard with Julie's uh, presentation, there is so much to learn. So that's, um, uh, that's the point on communication. Um, purpose, I think we're gonna skip over that, Dan, in the interest of time. Um, challenges, that's why I'm here. It is a challenge. As good as communication is in Connecticut, as supported as we are, getting the word out and getting family councils started is, has been a significant challenge. The challenge, and again, I'm not sure exactly what's up there, but the, the challenge is that people come and go. Um, you, you know, one month you may have someone who's ready to you know, be there for who knows how many years and then six months later their loved one has passed or uh, the family has moved or there's some, so there's such a lack of continuity in the population uh, of families that um, we, we have our challenges. And then also, we're not living, uh, the family members are not living under one roof. The family members, you know, could be scattered across the country. So we, we do have our challenges. And that's why I'm here. Mairead talked about the statewide family council that meets monthly. I think we have been meeting for about two years. Um, it is, for lack of a better word, a sort of a, a top-down system. There are, um, there's a board and there's, there are members who, who get together with Zoom anywhere from as little as five people to as middle, many as maybe 15. We have speakers, um, and our challenge is to get from the top and get into long-term care facilities. And here's where I ask you to give me some information and to help me understand what's out there, because we don't know um, where they are. I know that, you know, of, formally of about a dozen in the state, but there's almost 200 nursing you know, facilities, so where are we? So I have a question, I have a couple of questions, and I have to read them. 
Um, before today, could you raise your hand or tap your, your glass if you've ever heard of a family council? That's not bad. Okay, that's good. Have you seen a poster or any printed material in your home that advertises, gives information, et cetera, about a family council? Raise your hand if you, you've seen posters and you've, okay, that's less, just a, that's less, all right. Um, has your home ever had a family council in the past, but it no longer exists? Could you raise your hand? One, two, three, that's, that you had one? Just a few. Okay, there was a family council, but it no longer exists. Okay. Um, okay, here's the big one. <laughs> How many live in a home where there is a family council? There is a family, and I'm going to help me out with this. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. All right. Maybe under 10. I think, right, Mariah? Yeah, yeah, you have a loved, your family council, your, where you live or where your loved one lives has a family council, yeah. So, all right, 10. So let's double it today, okay. <laughs> so, um, And here's, a, here's one you don't have to raise your hand for, but I really want you to consider this, and I'll be doing the wedding thing and going around to tables because I, I, I don't have handouts, but I have a, a list, and I would love to talk to people who are interested in, in helping us to grow this. I think um, the national theme for Residents' Rights Month is Amplify Your Voices, and I'm here to ask you to help us to amplify this message. I only see good things coming out of this. I am so energized by the potential positive impact this will have when resident councils start to work with family councils. And I'll tell you, um, Maraid says I have a, um, a couple of extra minutes, so I'll tell a story. <laughs> um, my, I've had... Uh, I have several friends who live in long-term care, and I have uh, family members, my mom, my aunt, uh, who have who are passed, but my father lives in a managed residential community, and thank you to the Connecticut legislature who passed legislation this year where family councils are encouraged in managed residential communities. We're talking about assisted living, so that's where my dad lives. And we started our family council last month. We started with about 15 people, which was incredible. Uh, you know, usually you start with a couple of energetic people, and then maybe you'll get it. But we started with 15. And there was a, there's a young, no, there is a woman who is turned 100 in January, and she's the grand dame. She's a, she lives there. And her name is Dottie. And Dottie heard there was going to be a family council. And she was so excited to come to the meeting. And she said, oh, it's your big night tonight, Liz, right? You've got your meeting tonight. And, and she's gearing up to come to the meeting. And I said, Dottie, I have to tell you, it's not for, you. It's not for residents. She was completely crestfallen. You're having a meeting, and I can't. Uh, you know, she, she was dignified, but the two days later, how'd your meeting go? And what it said to me was, where there's vitality in a residence council, and where there's vitality in a family council, I believe there is absolutely no limits to what we can do to amplify the voices of people who live in long-term care and people who love people who live in long-term care. So I am beyond happy to be here. I look forward to visiting you at your table to answer individual questions, but if there's any general question at this point, I certainly would welcome them and try to answer them. Any questions for Liz? 
Yeah, my, I'm not as packed as Julie. Julie, I was writing notes left, right, and center when you were up there. But this is, this is pretty straightforward a bit. But um, I look forward to meeting you at your table and seeing how you can help We have us. one. Hi, my name is Denise. I'm from Glastonbury Healthcare Center. Um, I wanted to know if by any chance you're open, because I really do love my residents, every one of them, long term, short term. Um, but we usually see more people that come from out of state to visit our residents um, during the holiday time. And I would like to know if by any chance you would like to come so we can have this new resident and family council during the holidays when we have our major. So people can be aware of this happening so we can have more care because it's definitely very important that we all care for this, this, you know, this age because it's, you know, we were in there and we're gonna end it up in there and it has to be aware. We have to voice the needs for our families, our loved ones. And I would like to know by any chance that is something that you will be open, that we can invite you to come. You, you just, you made a good point, and I'm going to distill it to this. How about people who have family who live all over the country, right? So um, there is a family council at anybody from the Bridgeport, um, I don't know the name, there's one, it's a Jewish home in it's Bridgeport. Is there anybody here? Uh, so there, oh, this one too, they have a, what I hear is a vibrant family council completely remote. Yes. So it's run by a, a daughter who lives in Austin, Texas. Her mother lives in, um, in Bridgeport and she, and um, you know who I'm talking about. And, and so it's a virtual and this first family council in the uh, managed residential community that I am associated with was half virtual and half in person, it was terribly awkward. We're going all virtual next month. So to your point, it's a matter of capturing that audience around holidays and how do we do that? So when we come, I come to that table, maybe we can brainstorm about that. And you guys all have in your packet, you have information about the family councils in the packets and the regional ombudsman can assist and work with you on that as well. And Again, if your nursing home doesn't have a link large enough, you can let the regional ombudsman know and we will provide you with the Zoom and the information and everything so that it's not burdensome to the nursing home and they don't have to pay for it or anything like that. Okay? There's a question over here. Okay. Hey, Bobby. <laughs> That's Bobby. <laughs> yeah. He's just raising his hand. Yeah, I think they've been going for about six or seven months. Yeah, they actually already had me. And so, some family councils or resident councils, you can invite your regional ombudsman to come. The family and that family council has already invited me to come and um, talk with them about stuff. Okay, Cindy. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm recreation director at Bayview. Um, so Bayview does, uh, in theory, have, have a family council. There are sign-up sheets for it. And I think that we have a few people that are interested. But the problem, I think, is finding somebody to spearhead the project of getting it going. So as a recreation director, um, what, what can I do to facilitate that? And um, who should I connect with to who's, who's, who should be responsible for making sure that family council happens. You, you make a very good point because I know of homes too um, th that will be, remain unmentioned because it's not important but I know of a small handful where the rec you know, activities director are well intentioned, they want to get it started but it's not um, supposed to be run by staff. Kind of defeats the point. And, and how do you cross over and pass that baton? Let's talk and let's see if you can get a speaker in. Just generate some energy. Um, you know, and that, I think that's a huge challenge. We have many, many well-intentioned staff, um, especially in your department. And 
it, and how do we how do we take that and pass it on? Very hard, but let's see if we can, especially since I'm in your neighborhood, and what we could do is use, and we've talked about this in the statewide council, how do we you know, do the regions and make ourselves available to go in to sort of you know, put some energy in there into the families. Oh, I'll be at your table. <laughs> and Liz, I think it's also important to recognize the legislature worked hard to support us and residents and family members to pass a bill saying that our long-term care communities need to support, right, the starting of a resident council. So the nursing homes and rec directors, social workers, administration, working with and putting out flyers, putting up the date and time, saying this is when it's going to be, having speakers, you can do all of that, facilitating it. So you can be that spearhead. You can create the, the importance of it, yeah, and, and show that it's important and the value that's there. And because we know how important and how hard that is, the statewide family council has worked with us so that every month there's topics, or everything, is it a monthly or quarterly? Okay, monthly, I'm speaking correctly. We have a calendar so that you're not trying to create that. We've already created the content for you, so you can just take it from the statewide and say, this is what we're gonna do this month, making it very easy. We're trying to make it as easy as possible so the content's there, and you can just move forward um, for your family council. Uh, this, thank you. There's a QR code that's coming up, I think, and I don't. And there's also, you know, I don't know. I'm not a. That that may be difficult if you don't have a, a phone. But I wanted another anecdote about Connecticut in the grant in the greater scheme of of the country. We have uh, people who join us monthly who are not from Connecticut. They join on because it's the same Zoom link every month. They join us, uh, one woman from, uh, from Rhode Island, she's there every month. She just comes at, to use this monthly meeting as a resource. So anybody who is sitting in this room tonight, um, I invite you to join us on the last Tuesday of every month to just sit in, introduce yourself and and see what the resources are. And on the long-term care ombudsman website, um, it, you know, it's very easy finding all of the printed material that you know you, that's there to be had. But um, it's, there's nothing like the in-person or the on-screen, so to speak. So maybe some of you who are sitting here, um, t you know, this today, um, I'll see you next month um, at our monthly meeting. But again, I'll, I'll be walking around and ask more questions later. Are we good? I think we're good. Good, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I can put it right on the table again. So thank you. Liz, always so much information and awesome to work with. Great partner, thank you. And now we're gonna introduce another, I don't wanna squeak, a great partner and someone who has really educated me so often and partnered with our program, Judy Stein from the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and she's gonna talk to you all um, about your Medicare benefit and give you some information, so I'll, I welcome Judy. Come on up. Oh, she's going, big step. Oy. Thank you, Marie. Oh, Dan, can we go to my first slide and can people, Kathy, can you hear me? Okay, good. First thing I uh, want to do as the slides are coming up is uh, to tell you that I'm not Toby Edelman and I'm not getting an award. And uh, yes, I'm out of order in, in the program because um, uh, we have to be uh, flexible and adaptable and we're moving things around. So everything's gonna happen that you came to see today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot to say that, Judy. Okay. Did, we, I totally forgot to say that. We jumped, we moved some things around because of timing. So yeah. sorry. <laughs> That's good. That's why we're partners, Marade, right? Okay. That is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, hopefully Dan can find my slides, um, which I think we can... Now. Pardon? Okay. They're just connecting, they're coming through. Okay, great. 
I'm Judy Stein. I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. I am delighted to be here today and to increasingly partner with Mairead and her fabulous staff at the Connecticut Long-Term Care Ombudsman. They are the rock stars of the Ombuds national community. And um, here in Connecticut, of course, we're so lucky to have them. I also want to introduce my associate director, attorney Kathy Holt, who is um, at the table there, table 10, I think is the best table around. And um, Kathy is uh, the attorney who is our lead in of all the Connecticut advocacy and also day-to-day -day advocacy and involved in our policy work, which I'll tell you a little bit about. I want to particularly thank the administration for department, the Administration of Disability and Aging Services ads, <laughs> which name changes, but we are so grateful to be supported by the State Unit on Aging and by the department. And our wonderful Commissioner Amy Porter, who's so visible in the community and supportive of the work for older and uh, residents and people with disabilities throughout this state. And also the legislature, which has allowed the ads to the department to have funding for the center. Um, we really depend upon you to understand the value and importance of our work and allow us to continue to do it low these many years. Uh, the Center for Medicare Advocacy, I'll, I'll begin, um, is a national nonprofit law organization located in the college basketball Hall of Fame corner of Connecticut. We are in Mansfield, Connecticut, not far from the University of Connecticut, because I founded the organization in 1986 in my kitchen, and it's grown organically, fortunately, with incredible stars and staff. And we, however, want you all to know that we serve people for free throughout the state of Connecticut. Residents of Connecticut can call us uh, from nine to five every day, and a real live person will answer the phone, and someone will help you immediately with your problem or refer you immediately to one of our staff who can do that, and you will get help from a live human being, which I think is really a wonderful thing to um, make sure you know. We're based in Connecticut, as I say, and our funding to provide direct legal assistance, support, and education is for people in Connecticut. Our services are at no cost to you, and I'll describe them more. And we, because Medicare is a national program, we also aspire to be the hub of Medicare advocacy on behalf of people who rely on Medicare to access health care. And that means we have to know and be active at the national level because it's the Congress that is responsible for most of the law that makes Medicare happen or not happen as it should. So it's a unique marriage between national policy, state policy, and direct legal assistance. We provide help for all of Connecticut residents we hear the stories and problems and successes of people accessing Medicare for their health care, including their nursing home care and other care that residents of nursing homes need. And from those stories that we hear every day and the help that we give and try to give, we build our policy. I was testifying two weeks ago about home health care before the United States uh, Senate and we are invited to talk about Medicare Advantage and the problems with marketing at the United States Senate in a few weeks. We have a policy director and a K in DC, and occasionally, when necessary, we bring national litigation. Almost always, from the seed of the work we do and the direct legal assistance we provide for people here in Connecticut, and again, um, please know our services are at no cost for Connecticut residents due to the wonderful assistance and support we get from the Aging and Disability Services Department. Next slide, please. The services available in Connecticut 
are Medicare-related evaluations, legal assistance, and advocacy, and referrals out to our very many friends around the state uh, who can help you with other problems relating to your care, your health, and your well-being. We are very involved and as connected as we can be to the rights, the people who provide advocacy for elder rights, nursing home rights, and rights of people with disabilities throughout Connecticut. We um, are very involved with resident right education and policy activity. And one of the stars of that work is our senior policy attorney, Toby Edelman, who will receive the CAPSEC award later on today, who's um, providing a webinar upstairs in, in, a, um, in this facility about residence rights, which was previously scheduled. So you'll get to meet her. Our Connecticut resources are on a special location on our website, medicareadvocacy.org, that you see up there. And you can reach us toll free at 800 262 4414 outside the greater Mansfield Wyndham County area and at 860 456 7790 on the local line or if if the other line is busy. Please look at our website. We have a vast array of material online. And um, we have brought two pieces of material that are here today. Uh, one is a, a, a new flyer. It's a comic uh, uh, that I would have called it, a graphic flyer about nursing home rights and coverage under Medicare. And um, that's on the table by the, the long-term care ombudsman hats and other nice giveaways. And also, we have a brochure that will tell you in one brochure a very good overview of what Medicare covers and the rates for 2023. We will soon get the rates for 2024. And this is available here on the table in English and in Spanish. And if you do think that they would be valuable, not just to you, but in your um, facility, please take some extras or give us a call if you think you would like and use some more back at home. Next slide, please. Happily, over the last couple of years, we have been able to increase and formalize our relationship with the long-term care ombudsman. Kathy and I and Mairead and other staff members have been working closely together to try and make sure that we maximize the value of the staff and knowledge of each of our organizations and to try and make sure that we can refer problems that we hear about in, for nursing home residents in Connecticut to uh, the long-term care ombudsman office, and that in turn the ombudsman can know more about Medicare coverage for nursing home residents and be more aware when, the, and when they should push back about a denial or have the family or resident contact us. So we're really delighted to participate in this kind of joint education and a myriad sorts of direct ab of advocacy and outreach. And that includes doing some of our own rock flyers together. Make sure you take some pictures with um, the famous rocks outside in the hall. Thank you for working with us so well, Mairead, and understanding the value and importance of Medicare for residents. So let me tell you a little bit about Medicare coverage for skilled nursing facility, which is the Medicare term for nursing homes. So this is the coverage criteria for folks who are first entering a nursing home from a hospital, sometimes from the community, um, and if you're a resident of, the nursing, of a nursing home and have not received Medicare coverage and are a Medicare beneficiary uh, for 60 consecutive days and you go to the hospital or start a new Medicare benefit period, you may be eligible for another set of 100 days of coverage from your Medicare plan or traditional Medicare. Just know this generally and know that you can contact the Center for Medicare Advocacy if it seems that you should be getting coverage and you're not or the people you're trying to advocate for are not. 
a physician or health practitioner, now a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner, must have ordered the care. The care must be a Medicare certified facility. Generally, if you're in traditional Medicare, you need to have had a three-day inpatient hospital stay and generally go to the nursing home thereafter or go back. In Medicare Advantage plans, the private plans that a lot of folks and retirees from the state have, sometimes that hospital stay is waived. But uh, generally, these are the basic criteria. In addition, next slide please, you um, need to receive daily skilled care in the nursing facility, and if you are, you can get 100 days of coverage first 20 days in full, and the next 20 days there'd be a copay. Skilled services are nursing and therapy. It needs to be daily, but that is five days a week for physical therapy, not seven, and seven days a week for a combination of nursing and therapy combined. Next slide, please. This is another way of looking at Medicare co basic coverage for nursing home care in this graphic. You need to have a doctor or a healthcare practitioner order the care. You need to receive daily skilled care. And then it needs to be in provided in a Medicare certified facility. And you can see this is the basic criteria. And if you think the person you're helping or you meet these criteria and you're not getting coverage, please do contact the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Next slide, please. Here's an important reminder. In the nursing home setting and in the community of home setting for home health care and in outpatient therapy, you do not have to improve or improve within a significant certain period of time or a certain amount to get Medicare coverage. The question is, do you need skilled care, that nurse or therapy, the requisite amount of time in order to maintain your condition or slow decline, that also is coverable under Medicare. We often find that's not understood or believed, and we are here, folks, to make sure that if you need these services to maintain your condition or slow decline, often true of a nurse for wound care, therapy, physical or occupational therapy, or speech language pathology services, for, on, for maintaining or slowing decline, making sure you s can stay at least as well as you are. Next slide, please. Now, importantly, for people who are not eligible any longer or um, cannot get coverage for the room and board and the overall care that's being provided in the nursing home, there may be some other services that are covered by Medicare. That could include your, um, if you have Part B of Medicare or in a Medicare Advantage plan, that could include physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech language pathology as a Part B standalone service. Again, you might need that to maintain your well-being and health. If you do, as well as if you need it to improve, you might be able to get Medicare coverage and contact us about that. You might be able to get ambulance transportation to the nearest facility or place where you can get care that isn't available in your nursing home. Sometimes hospice care for the services, not the room and board, is available for nursing home residents. Regrettably, durable medical equipment like wheelchairs are not covered separately by Medicare for nursing home residents. There's a long and Unfortunate story as to why, but that's the way it is. Next slide, please. We know that increasingly people are in what are known as Medicare Advantage, private insurance plans that are contracted with the Medicare program. We want you to know that if that's the case for you or someone you're trying to help, which could be because um, increasing, um, well, state retirees are in such plans, retired teachers are often in these plans, and increasingly the percentage of people in Connecticut are increasing that are in Medicare Advantage plans. 
Everything I told you about the law is true for Medicare Advantage as well as for traditional Medicare under the law. But in practice, regrettably, we find that the, the um, benefit is shortchanged too often, particularly for people who are still qualified for nursing home coverage. We are getting constant calls about people who are getting constant um, weekly denials and having to appeal them and deal with that anxiety on top of the other conditions they're dealing with in the nursing home. We know this is a terrible problem for the providers as well as for residents and families, and we're here to help you with that. Note that one of the better things about Medicare Advantage, which should be true for all in Medicare, is that Medicare Advantage plans generally waive that three-day hospital requirement before getting nursing home coverage under Medicare. Next slide, please. F finally, substantively, I want to um, bring home, it is um, quickly coming upon us, this, the start of what's known as the annual enrollment period or open enrollment period for Medicare, um, starting on October 15th, going through December 7th, people can look at and should the way you're receiving your, um, your Medicare through a private plan or through traditional Medicare with a Medigap supplemental insurance to pay for the coinsurances and premiums required by traditional Medicare, by Part D to pay for prescription drugs. How are you getting your Medicare? Will the care providers you need be available to you in 2024? How do you want to get those Medicare benefits in 2024? Between October 15th and December 7th, everyone can and should look at how they're getting their coverage now and see if it will likely meet your needs in 2024. We all get sick. We sometimes get injured. Sometimes they happen at the same time. You want to make sure as best as possible that you have the Medicare and other health insurances that are necessary if those things happen, if you get sick and if you get injured. We are partnered also with the Choices Program. We provide the training for our Choices Program with the state, which is the Connecticut State Health Insurance Program. You see their 800 number here, 1-800-994. 9422. Please, early on, contact the Choices Program for assistance if you need help navigating choices between Medicare for 2024. And if you also happen to be eligible for Medicaid, the Choices volunteers and staff can help you with how to coordinate that and what might be best for you for 2024. Now, this program sets are becoming more and more complicated. We do the best we can to partner with Choices and with uh, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Office, with the Aging and Disability Services Department. Make sure you do your diligence and contact Choices early on, soon, in this enrollment period. They may well have to take appointments and get back to you because it's true that we are all under-resourced and the programs are more complicated. Please do try and um, get assistance if you want to consider w how you get your Medicare and or Medicaid and health insurances in the coming year. Next slide, please. So that's the Center for Medicare Advocacy. We do the best we can to coordinate with all the other wonderful um, entities involved with the elder rights Disability Rights and Healthcare Rights Network here in Connecticut and indeed around the country. We're a unique use resource. Please take advantage of us here in Connecticut. Uh, we can connect your story to experts around the, uh, in the nation's capital. We have, a fa we have a fantastic congressional delegation. We are very involved with our senators and our congressional representatives they do hear the plight of people in nursing homes, the fact that they were involved with visitation rights during COVID and other activities now to make sure that residents and their families are heard 
and that Medicare provides the coverage and access to care that it's required to under the law. We have free legal assistance available to you and support. Please contact us at the Center for Medicare Advocacy and look at our website, medicareadvocacy.org, or call us 860-456-7790. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marit. Judy, stay up there for one second. I see Representative Hughes has her hand up, so hang on one second. I'm just gonna give a big plug as a social worker and uh, elder care manager, geriatric care manager. Um, routinely, our elders uh, will fall or break a hip or something, go into hospital, then go into uh, rehab, where Medicare is supposed to cover up to 100 days. Routinely, they get discharged from Medicare because they, get, uh, they say you're done and they still need to be in rehab, they still need long-term care, this is when you have to call um, you know, the Center for Medicare Advocacy and um, appeal that. Appeal, appeal, appeal. Because they, once you appeal it, they'll say, okay, we'll cover for another week. Keep in mind, when they discharge you, you're on private pay after that. And so we have to fight over and over. This is not automatic especially if your loved one has dementia. If they have dementia, they'll kick them out right, right away, unfortunately, um, from being covered by Medicare, and then it's private pay, and that can be incredibly costly. So, so please um, know that you're right, is that you, know, it, you can appeal and say, no, my loved one needs OT, they need um, maintenance therapy, even if they're not getting much better, especially because they have dementia, they need this because, um, because of the you know, injury or, or episode that got them in the hospital in the first place. So that, number one, you're gonna have to appeal, you're gonna have to fight for them. Yes, 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 and thank you. Amen, Representative Hughes, thank you. And she's a champion in the legislature for us and for the rights of people who rely on Medicare and who need care on an ongoing basis, thank you. It shouldn't be this way. These, are, these denials are in, inappropriate and they wear us down. I'm looking at Matt, they wear providers down, they wear families down. I believe that's intended. We have to stick together and fight back, push back do the best we can with our limited resources to help and to help you fight back. Know you have support. Thank you, and we're so lucky because my peers um, throughout the country are very envious of how much support we get here, so thank you. And it goes back to you, Marade. Also in your booklet, um, thank you, Marade, and has our um, flyer about how to re reach the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Thank you. Okay, and we are jumping around a little bit today. Um, we are going to do one of the awards now, one of the awards later. So I don't know how many of you, I keep, I keep bringing the mics up and leaving them up here. Um, I don't know how many of you here remember Brian Capshaw. A few of you probably do. So Brian was a resident who just was a fighter, was a leader, really was a rock star related to residents' rights. And Brian pushed and really felt that residents needed to be heard not only in our state, but nationally. And um, I remember the first time Brian as a resident joined me in DC at a conference and decided to roll himself across a highway to get to a restaurant he wanted to go to on the other side of the highway and almost gave me a heart attack. But that's where he wanted to go and that's where he wanted to eat. So we went. Um, and that's just how he lived. He lived very big, very large. Um, no one told Brian no. Um, and he made sure he was heard all the time. So when Brian sadly passed away, we developed a rock star award for people who made sure they were always heard and that no one really ever says no to and made sure that they always spoke up for what they felt was right. And on an annual basis, we name um, the Brian Rockstar Award to someone 
and the residents pick who this goes to. And what's funny this year, we were going over names, and the first name that came up was Toby Edelman. And Toby is here with us today from DC. And I asked for a second nomination. And Susan, is who is here, said, why would we give a second nomination? When you have the best, you go with the best, which was very cute. And all the residents agreed. And they said they had come up with the best person to receive this award. And so we are so happy that Toby is here today. And Toby, can you please come up so we can give you the Brian Capshaw Rockstar Award? Thank you so much for this honor. I was so surprised and overwhelmed when Mairead called me and asked me if I could come to Connecticut today. Of, of course I said I'd be here. I don't know of any other state where the residents get together as you do. What you have in Connecticut is such a model for other states and I wish it would be replicated. To receive an award in Brian Capshaw's name is especially meaningful to me. I met Brian at an annual meeting of Consumer Voice in Washington, D.C., and he was a force of nature. Smart, funny, focused, and determined. He's a role model for all of us in how to be an effective advocate. I have worked in Washington, D.C. for more than 46 years representing residents. It's my life's work as an attorney. You are the reason that I do the work I do. Advocates want all residents, all of us, to have the best care possible each and every day. Advocates for residents like me try to make sure that the laws and regulations that govern nursing homes set high standards, that they address your real needs for high quality of care and high quality of life, what matters most to you. We also try to make sure that these laws and regulations are enforced if and when they are violated. We want to give you information about what is happening and what you can do about it, and we want to support you and your advocacy and help carry your message as widely as we can. We do our best work when we work with you. It's not often that federal policymakers hear directly from residents or their families and advocates. Usually, policymakers hear primarily from nursing home owners and operators and the trade associations that represent them. At their best, they care about the same things we do, but not all do, not all of the time. Right now, we have an extraordinary opportunity to speak directly to the federal agency that writes nursing home standards of care, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. In 2022, President Biden announced a comprehensive nursing home reform agenda. It was the first time we ever heard a president talk about nursing home residents in the State of the Union address. In fact, he said it again in 2023. He said that care for residents needs to be much better. The COVID-19 pandemic brought home to many people that too many nursing homes have serious problems in the ways they operate. The president's reform agenda has a lot of important pieces, but the most important part is nurse staffing. For the first time ever, an administration in Washington is proposing that the government set and enforce minimum nurse staffing levels for nursing homes. CMS is proposing specific numbers of hours for registered nurses and nurse aides, and it's proposing that a registered nurse be available 24 hours per day in every nursing home, whether it's urban or rural, whether it's large or small. Many of us believe that the rule needs to be even stronger, though, that it needs to talk about licensed practical nurses and total numbers of hours for all nursing staff. We will be writing about the changes that we, that we think will make the rule stronger and better. But this is your chance to tell CMS why nurse staffing matters to you. Everything you have to say about staffing matters and is important. CMS needs to hear the good stories, when a nurse or nurse aide did something that really helped you or another resident and why it mattered. Good stories can show CMS why having enough nurses and nurse aides is critical and matters to the care you receive every day. But CMS also needs to hear the bad stories when your facility didn't have enough nurses or nurse aides, when you had to wait a long time for a nurse aide to help you get up and dressed in the morning, 
when you had to wait a long time to get your call bell answered and what happened while you waited. CMS needs to hear when you didn't get your medication on time, when you missed a shower or activity you liked because your facility was short-staffed, when a staff member was rude or inconsiderate. You need to see it, tell CMS what happened and how these bad incidents made you feel. CMS needs to hear what happens to residents when their facilities don't have enough nursing staff. And CMS needs to hear your recommendations about how to improve staffing. You might want to send in comments um, explaining your personal experiences, or maybe your resident council can draft a letter together and you can put all your names on it if you want to. Please encourage your families and friends to send comments too. There's no right or wrong way. The important point is to make your voice heard. CMS is accepting comments until November 6th, so there's still time to think about what you want to say. Mairead, Mairead, the Connecticut Ombudsman Program, and the Center for Medicare Advocacy can all help and let you know where to send your comments. You can send them by snail mail or by email. But whichever way you tell CMS your story, CMS will be listening. Again, thank you for this honor, and I am very thrilled to be with, here, with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. And Toby was, I just have to say, steadfast. During the visitation crisis, when we went to DC to push to have everyone um, allowed visitation during COVID, and now for the staffing, so yes, and if you need help related to staffing, please let your ROs know and we will connect you. So next, I would like to invite John to come up. He's gonna be there? Okay. I will get him a mic. John is the president of our Executive Board of Presidents of Resident Council, and he is going to do a presentation on about resident councils. Thank you for allowing us to jump around a little bit today. We had some scheduling changes for individuals, which happens sometimes. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> okay, I, I was here last year and I was talking about how to set up a resident council. So this year, seeing that we're talking about family councils and everything, I thought it would be good to talk about how to engage interest during a resident council meeting and to give you some things to think about when putting together your agenda or things like that. As a resident council president, we need to run meetings in an orderly and timely matter, <laughs> manner so the residents will not get bored while participating in the meeting. Today, I will show, share a few ways to engage residents so that they will be interested in coming to meetings and talking about issues that are important to them. Resident councils have several purposes. To give residents participation in affairs within the facility, to give residents a forum to dis afford discussion for, of concerns within the facility, to serve as a line of communication between residents and staff, 
to serve as an informal forum to empower residents to advocate on issues that affect the, their home, community, and quality of care and life, to discuss concerns, to determine patterns, and allow for formal resolution. And it ensures that the nursing home is working to residents' best interest and in creating home-like environments on resident preferences. And the benefits of having a resident council. A resident council is an organized and ongoing support mechanism for residents. They share experiences. Residents are able to draw strength from one another. Residents feel comfortable discussing their concerns and or wishes in a safe environment. Resident councils also provide an opportunity for resident interaction and engagement with their peers. And for the home, resident councils allow for the greater communication between residents and staff. Residents councils provide discussion opportunities for a collaboration between resident and staff. A mechanism to address concerns to improve the quality of life and care in the facility. Now the model resident council. Residents run the council. Residents fill key positions such as president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary. The council receives no interference from the facility staff. Residents feel comfortable speaking freely, raising issues and concerns. Residents are treated in a dignified manner. Residents' issues and concerns are taking, taken seriously. Issues and concerns are promptly addressed by the appropriate department. Now, some best practices for a resident council. Resident council meetings are marketed and advertised. And if you want residents to come, you consider uh, invitations. Council meetings are consistent, same day, time, and location each month. Each meeting has a prepared agenda with input from council members. Council is governed by bylaws that are unique to the home and community. Bylaws detail election process. Minutes are taken, reviewed, and approved by council members. Council communication form is utilized, passed, passed on to appropriate departments, resolution indicated, signed off by both administration and resident council. Meetings are accessible to all residents wishing to participate. Use of adaptive technology and recording meetings for those who cannot come in person. Resident council and food committee are separate and distinct meetings. We usually have ours like 15 minutes before our resident councils begins. One great way to, to, a, to keep a, a meeting on track is engaging and engaging is to have an agenda prepared so residents know how the meeting will progress. Up on the screen here, there are two template agendas. On the agenda, we talk about old business, new business, include special items such as the e-board or other items of interest. Then we proceed to the department issues and concerns. This is where residents can voice their concerns, whether good or bad, under the following. Nursing, 
housekeeping, laundry, maintenance, and recreation. On this slide, you will see an example of how the minutes of a meeting may be kept. This helps to make sure we know where we left off last month. For myself, it seems I go through the agenda and the meeting. It ends in about 20, 25 minutes. Therefore, I made it a point to reevaluate the way I do meetings. So what can I do to add to the meeting and make it more engaging and interesting to the residents? There are several ways we can keep the interest of residents. Give them a chance to raise concerns and listen to their concerns. Remind the resident that the residents that the facility needs to be held accountable. Residents need to identify problems that come up and come up with solutions from a resident's perspective. Allow residents to recognize staff if they feel deserving of recognition. Open discussions on topics of interest to residents, such as how to file a grievance, what's included in a care plan meeting, or simply go over the residents' rights. And a key, keys to success, self-interest, Residents will want to be involved if the council is discussing an issue that is important to them. It may be helpful to identify the issues of interest for the council members and focus on those issues during the meeting. Results. Getting results is a big motivator for residents to continue to attend the council meetings. Thus, the council is viewed as a forum for resolving concerns, implementing new ideas, and sharing suggestions. Recognition. Recognize council members who help, who provide helpful solutions or make important contributions to the council. Accountability. The council must always keep written records of any actions by the council affecting any or all the residents. Policy change request. A resident may ask the council to convince the facility to change any practices the resident deems unnecessary or harmful. Now, this has been, this is, was uh, included from one of our other uh, e-board members. Advocating for resident rights is something you don't just have to do on your, your own facility. Here in Connecticut, we have a statewide coalition of presidents of resident council where we all get together and talk about making changes at a larger level. We have an executive board known as the e-board and we tossed around ideas on how we can get new members to join the e-board. After much discussion we decided on the following solution. As the president of the S. CPRC, we now include other residents who come to the meetings and be advocates for the facility. Any nursing home member can join the coalition to be a voice for those who do not come to meetings and cannot speak for themselves. Even if they are not the president of their resident council, coalition members can come and be the eyes and ears and keep the RCP informed of what goes on. In keeping with our motto, 
It's your choice. Let's hear your voice. Because the more voices we have, the louder we can be heard. This is a submission from eborn member Jeanette Sullivan Martinez about her ex experience in joining the SCPRC. This information is also, also inside the Silver Panther along with your attendee packet. Feel free to hang the poster in the building and let others, residents know about the op opportunity to enact change. Here's a slide showing what the poster looks like in the Silver Panther. We look forward to hearing from you and having you join the coalition. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. So these are e-board members and I wanna thank John. I wanna tell you a little bit of a funny story. We sent John sort of a, a base of some slides and some stuff and one of the funniest emails I got back, he sent them back and was like, no, this is not what I wanna say. I'll get back to you. And then he sent back his slides and they were all, he was like, yeah, no, that doesn't work for me. So I thought that was awesome that you were like, I, I can do this myself, lady. Um, and you rewrote them and they, you got your notes in there and they were awesome. And I'm very proud of you for taking that on and doing that. Thank you guys for coming up with how you want your board to run and for supporting us. For those of you who don't know, how many people here see the Silver Panther that these guys and my team worked to put together? I should see a lot more hands. All right, so the Silver Panther goes out seasonally. The Silver Panther was named by the residents. It has a big Silver Panther on the front. It is your newsletter for residents about what is happening long-term care-wise in the state. It's also on our website. It goes to all you rec directors. So all you rec directors, you should be making sure it's getting to the residents. And for policymakers, department heads, um, anybody here, if you wanna get anything to the residents directly, you can always ask us to put something in the Silver Panther. All right? Okay, and with that, they are gonna start to um, bring lunch through. Dan is going to give the legislative update as they're starting to serve lunch. And then we are going to do one more award at 12.30 um, when a family member arrives. Um, and then we'll do open forum after, at one o'clock, okay? All right. Alrighty, everybody, and so feel free to eat while I give a brief legislative update on the Connecticut legislative session for 2023. So again, good morning and soon to be afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted again to present and provide a brief big picture Connecticut legislative update. First, congratulations e-board members, resident council leaders, and all other attendees for your advocacy efforts to protect and ensure resident rights and ensure and maximize quality of life and quality of care for nursing home residents. A brief 2023 Connecticut legislative session was a long budget focused every other year session started on January 4th and ended on June 7th. Democrats controlled both the House and Senate by large majorities again this year, 98 to 53 in the House and 24 to 12 in the Senate. A large state budget was approved late session by a large bipartisan majority in both the House and Senate and signed by Governor Lamont. 
a large fiscal year 2022-2023 state budget surplus and a large state rainy day fund cushion, unlike budgets of four to five plus years ago, were the backgrounds to the session. Along with fiscal spending cap, legislators saw this as limiting more expansive state appropriations. The state budget included tax cuts for the first time in decades in Connecticut and other bills related to the implementation of early voting, greater phased in income tax exemptions for retirement income and gun violence reform. Related to long-term care, um, there was positive measures passed this session, including greater nursing home transparency for the Connecticut Department of Social Services cost reporting to help determine what are the real nursing home costs, given that many nursing homes have multiple corporate structures and related parties, and it can be hard to follow the money. Two, greater public availability of such DSS reports. More efficient use of state and federal funds by nursing homes. Improved review and requirements for nursing home change of ownership and for greater accountability and to keep out bad actors. Five, greater protections for residents related to long-term care involuntary discharge notices and such notices would be invalid if the nursing home did not provide them to both the nursing or the resident and the long-term care ombudsman and many other consumer and resident family-friendly measures. On February 10th, the long-term care ombudsman program, the e-board, the statewide coalition of family councils and other advocacy organizations rallied at the legislative office building prior to the public hearing on Senate Bill 989. A comprehensive nursing home reform bill, the hearing lasted all day and then late into the evening. The rally highlighted the very real poor nursing home staffing and care concerns that many residents face. Senate Bill 989 would have required an increase in state nursing home staffing to 4.1 hours of care per resident per day, an increase from the 3.0 current hours uh, individuals face, along with m other many measures. A corollary bill, Senate Bill 1026, would have phased those staffing measures in, first to 3.6 hours per day, and then increased to 4.1 within a few years. And while unfortunately increased nursing home staffing was not approved during the 2023 session, there were possible reasons, including cost and staffing availability, as well as the hope and backdrop for a first ever national nursing home staffing requirement, which the White House and federal government's Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services released in early September as a proposed rule, of which I will touch on briefly. But meanwhile, Back here in Connecticut, some of the key bills that passed this session include, um, and, and also if you wanted to review these later, you can go to the Connecticut General Assembly website, as well as the Long-Term Care Ombudsman's Advocacy Center page to learn more. But a brief overview again. House Bill 5004, an act implementing early voting, allows for uh, after January 1st, 2024, for general elections, there will be a 14 day of early voting. For primaries, there will be a seven day of early voting. For presidential primaries and special elections, you will now have four days of early voting. Early voting will include weekend days. And while towns will have the discretion to determine the number of early voting sites, each town will have at least one early voting location. Oh. House Bill 5781. Now this bill consolidated four other bills, 930, 1024, 6678, 1025, and the ultimate 5781. Uh, this bill includes the provisions about discharge notices and the affirmation needed. The bill provides access to the discharge plan by the long-term care ombudsman program. It includes financial transparency requirements and related party cost reports required to be reported to from 30,000 down from 50,000. The bill also requires assisted living facilities to encourage and assist the development of family councils. A dementia service coordinator position was created at the Department of Aging and Disability Services, and it also will transfer the homemaker companion agency jurisdiction from the Department of Public Health 
to the Department of Consumer Protection for many greater consumer protections. 6731 includes provisions that, the, uh, that require greater scrutiny and review of change of ownership for nursing homes with the goal of keeping out bad actors. 6741 requires the Department of Public Health uh, announcements against greater uh, or against aggressive behaviors towards healthcare workers. 6775 expanded the uh, criteria and in individuals who are concerned related mandated reporters. Senate Bill 956 uh, regarding discharge ensures that greater collaboration and services are provided to individuals who are discharging from nursing facilities and hospitals. Senate Bill 1088, greater financial protections for individuals, uh, for senior citizens and responsibility and requirements for financial organizations to help protect seniors. 6941 included one section about a work group study for nursing home excess bed capacity and another section provides for compensation for family caregivers under Connecticut Medicaid waivers. Now as far as nationally and at the federal level, uh, Toby did briefly discuss it, but I will touch on as well the fact that uh, CMS did release on September 6th a minimum staffing proposal. This is the first federal minimum staffing proposal and we are currently in the comment period. Some highlights include higher nursing uh, and CNAs. However, it did leave out uh, LPNs, which is a cr who do play a critical role within nursing facilities. Now, there is opposition on both sides. Advocates who have been uh, expressing the need for even higher staffing minimums of 4.1 for decades, uh, and also uh, opposition in the healthcare industry about their prohibitive costs and staffing implementation challenges. So it will take strong advocacy efforts to get this over the finish line, and every person counts. So while, again, we are in the 60-day comment period for the notice, it is important to submit testimony and comment. And so if you need any assistance in that, I've included information in the slides, which will be available after today's presentation. And also feel free to reach out to your long-term care ombudsman. We have information uh, that includes even step-by-step -step instructions on how to submit public comment. And then, again, just before I wrap up, looking forward to the Connecticut 2024 legislative session, some of the issues that may uh, come up uh, include continued expansion of the ombudsman program to address the continual increase in number and complexity of concerns raised to the program, ensuring that facilities, when taking new admissions, are able to meet and maintain the minimum staffing standard of three hours per day based on their current and projected uh, census data. Increasing access to services for protections for individuals in nursing homes under the age of 70 with memory care concerns by ensuring that appropriate testing, counseling, and access to treatments is provided. An interagency team to review the buyers of new nursing facilities to ensure that owners with history of providing substandard care are not permitted to expand or start operations within our state. And finally, identifying low quality homes, and if it's identified and determined that they are below the standard, then the facility must independently hire a consultant from an approved list that ensures that they do meet the quality standard moving forward. And now, we've provided a big picture overview. We've summarized some key nursing home and long-term care state legislation. We've mentioned the federal initiatives to improve the quality of care for our residents and discussed some possible 2024 other legislative goals on the state level. And now while there have been many positive achievements in the 2023 legislative session, I wish you all again the best wishes and advocacy for the 2024. Thank you all so much and enjoy your lunches. And so again, we'll, uh, we'll be doing the awards in about 20 minutes for the second award. So again, enjoy.